Hello friends and welcome to tonight's calm reading of sleep stories. I shall be reading for you a few stories from Sandman's Goodnight Stories by Abby Phillips Walker. Before we begin, find yourself a place where you can relax. Once you have settled into that place, make yourself comfortable and take a deep breath. And let us begin these stories. The Telltale Goblin Once upon a time there was a little fairy who loved to wander by the river. And as the fairy queen does not like her subjects to go too near the water, the little fairy had to steal away. Always when they held a revel, this little fairy would fly away from the dance and wander down by the river to watch the ripple of the water as it flowed over the pebbles and stones. One night, a goblin, who always watched the fairies, happened to be sitting under a bush and saw the little fairy. What is she doing here all alone? he said to himself. She has run away from her sisters and I am quite sure the queen does not know where she is. I'll watch her, and if she is up to mischief, I'll tell the queen. Maybe she'll give me a new red coat for telling her. Now this little telltale goblin began to watch, and pretty soon he saw a mist rise from the river. Then it looked like foam, all silvery in the moonlight. And then, suddenly, as he watched, the goblin saw a handsome youth rise from the river and hold out his arms to the little fairy standing on the bank. Aha, said the goblin, she has a lover, has she? Well, I'll tell the queen, and I guess these midnight meetings will be stopped. And I'm sure now I shall get a new coat for telling. The river youth called to the fairy just then, and the goblin forgot the red coat to watch what happened. Come, my love, called the white youth. Take the willow path, and you will be safe from the water. The little fairy flew to the willow tree beside the river, and tripped lightly along the slender bough which dipped its tip into the water. When she reached the end, the white youth was there to take her in his arms. He carried her to the middle of the river, where there was a little island, and the watching goblin saw them sit upon the soft green grass in the moonlight. But he could not hear what they said. I'll run and tell her queen, and let her catch them, said the goblin, and forgetting that his red coat could be plainly seen in the moonlight. He jumped up and ran along the river bank, toward the dell. Oh, oh, cried the little fairy with alarm when she saw the goblin. Whatever will become of me, there is a goblin, and I am sure he has seen me, and is going to tell the queen, oh dear, oh dear, I shall be banished. The river youth, who was really a river god, reached for a horn of white shell which hung from his shoulder by a coral chain, and blew a shrill blast, and the goblin fell upon his face on the ground. Rise, called the river god, and tell me where you are going. Oh, your majesty, said the sly little goblin, I was about to go to the fairy queen and tell her one of her fairies was being carried off but of course I shall not do so now. I see whom she is with. I thought it was old Neptune himself, and he might change her into a mermaid. The river god knew the bad little fellow was telling him a wrong story. But something must be done, 
so he pretended to believe the goblin and said, Well, now you know the fairy is safe. What can I do for you if you keep our secret? Give me a silver cap, said the goblin quickly. Very well, come here tomorrow night at midnight hour, and you shall have the cap if you have not told the fairy queen what you have seen, said the river god. The goblin promised, and off he ran to his home in the rocks, and the river god took the fairy back to the willow tree. Come tomorrow without your wand, my love, he said. We must not delay now that the goblin has seen us. For he cannot be trusted after he gets the silver cap. The next night the goblin was by the river, waiting when the little fairy arrived. Where is your wand? he asked, for he saw at once she did not have it. Before she could reply, there was splash in the middle of the river, and out of the mist and foam, the river god lifted his head and called to the fairy. At the same time, he held up a little silver cap to the goblin. The little fairy went to her lover by the same path as before, but she took from his hand the little silver cap and tossed it to the goblin before she flew into her lover's outstretched arms. Now tell him where your wand is, said the river god. I left it behind me in the dell, she said, blushing and hanging her head. What? Are you not going back to the queen? asked the goblin in astonishment. Are you to become a river sprite? You have guessed it, said the river god. This night we are to be married at the bottom of the river. Farewell, you little tell-tale goblin. I hope your silver cap fits your peaked little head. The goblin watched the fairy and her lover as they slowly sank from sight. And then he ran off as fast as he could to the dell to tell the queen what he had seen. I'll get a red coat too, he said. I did not promise not to tell tonight. The tell-tale goblin was so bent on telling the queen what he knew, that he quite forgot his new silver cap, until he reached the dell, where the fairies were dancing. Then, throwing away his old cap, he clapped the silver cap on his head, so hard he cried out with pain. For a second he saw stars, and the cold silver felt very different from his soft, warm, peaked cap which he had tossed aside. The little fairies, seeing the goblin hopping about in the moonlight, called to the queen. Oh, look, dear queen, drive away the goblin. He acts quite mad and may mean mischief. The queen, knowing that goblins, when they were quite sane, were not friendly to her fairies, held up her wand and cast a ray of light straight into the goblin's eye. Leave our dell, she said, or something will happen to you that you will not like. Oh, wait, wait and hear what I have to tell, called the goblin. I know a secret you must hear. Oh, don't listen to him, dear queen, said all the little fairies. It is wrong to tell secrets. Go away, we will not listen. But the goblin would not go. He wanted to win a red coat, and he was sure the queen would give it to him for the secret he could tell. If you will give me a new red coat, I will tell you something about one of your fairies you would like to know, said the goblin. Oh, what a funny head he has said a fairy, as the goblin lifted off the silver cap, because it was so uncomfortable. All the fairies began to laugh, and on his head he clapped the cap, again to hide his queer peaked head. 
and again the cap made him see stars until he jumped with pain. Oh, he is quite mad, you may be sure, said the queen. I am not mad, listen and I will tell you the secret, and you will know then I am very clever to have discovered it, said the goblin. But first, I must know if you will give me the red coat. I shall not tell you if you do not. The telltale goblin did not think for a minute the queen of the fairies would refuse to pay to hear a secret. And when the queen told him he was a bad, mad fellow and to be off, he was quite surprised. You will be sorry, he said as he hopped away, and then he thought he would tell it, anyway. For what was the use of knowing a secret if you did not surprise others by showing how much you know? Back he ran, but the fairies and the queen put their fingers in their ears and ran away, so they could not hear. The telltale goblin, however, was bound to tell and he ran until he was near enough to shout. She has married a river god, and she left her wand in the dell. They gave me the silver cap not to tell. When the queen and the fairies heard this, they stopped, and the goblin thought they wished to hear more. So he went to them and said he would help them hunt for the wand, if they would come to the dell. The queen put a finger on her lips to warn the fairies not to speak, and back they went to the dell, following the goblin, who was hopping and jumping along before them. Here it is, he said, stooping to pick up a little gold wand. Hold, cried the queen, do not touch it. I will pick it up, and now that you have told us the secret, you shall have your reward. The goblin hopped with delight, for he was sure the queen would touch him with the wand, and he would have a new red coat at once. You shall wear the silver cap the rest of your life, she said, and before the goblin could jump away, the queen tapped him on the head, and in place of the telltale goblin there stood a silver thistle, all prickly and shining among the leaves and bushes. Your sister has left us, and we must forget her, said the queen, as the fairies followed her home. Let her be forgotten by you all. Her wand shall be saved for a more worthy sister. The little fairy never regretted marrying her river god, for she lived happy ever after. And sometimes, when they come up from the river bottom to sit in the moonlight, she will say to the river god, what do you suppose became of the goblin? Do you think he ever told the queen? Of course he did, replied the river god. He ran as fast as he could to the queen, but the silver cap was so uncomfortable for him to wear that I am sure he has discarded it long before this. So he gained nothing for playing the spy. Perhaps his conscience pricked him and he is sorry, said the little fairy. The little fairy was right. The goblin was sorry when it was too late, and the silver thistle swayed in the breeze. It tried to tell the breeze it was sorry for telling tales, but even the breeze did not wish to listen to a prickly thistle. So there it had to bloom, unloved, and alone the rest of its life. Dame Cricket's Story Come, children, it is time to get up, said Dame Cricket to her ten little crickets. Hurry now, and take your bath, and put on your little black caps and your little brown suits. The sun has almost gone down over the hill, and the birds will soon be asleep. But the little crickets snuggled under the bedclothes just as if they did not hear their mother's words. Come, come, she said, a few minutes later, 
you will sleep all night if you don't hurry. Some of our cousins are already singing, and it will soon be dark. Oh dear, why do we have to get up? said one little cricket, poking his head over the clothes. Lots of bugs sleep all night. Yes, but they are up all the daytime, answered Dame Cricket. And they run a great risk, I can assure you, my dear. Our family used to sing in the daytime, but if we had kept on, there would be no cricket family. There is a reason for our sleeping days and singing at night. Oh, mother, is it a story? asked all the little crickets, jumping out of bed with a bound and gathering about their mother. Yes, there is a story about our family, and if you will all hurry and dress, I will tell it to you, she said. Very quietly, all the little crickets began to dress, and their mother began the story. Once, long, long ago, she said, our family sang in the daytime and slept at night. But one day, the great grandfather cricket noticed that our singing was not as loud as usual, so he called all the children, big and little, about him, and looked at their throats. Strange, strange, he remarked, you all have fine-looking throats, as fine as ever crickets had, and yet our singing is very faint. There is not as much volume to it as in the old days. I will call on Dr. Frog this very day and see what he thinks about it. Dr. Frog thought a while, and then he asked, How many have you in your family now, Mr. Cricket? Great-grandfather called us all about him and began to count, and to his amazement he found our family was only about half the size it should be. Just as I thought, said Dr. Frog, the voices are as good as ever, but there are not so many of you, and, of course, the singing is not so loud as it was once. Shall I tell you the reason for this? asked Mr. Frog. Great-grandfather said that was why he called on him, so Dr. Frog told him that the birds were eating our family, and if they kept it up, we soon would be out of existence. Horrors, horrors, chirped great-grandfather Cricket. Whatever will we do to preserve the family? Easy enough to do that, said Dr. Frog. Sleep days and sing at night, as our family do. Little chance we would have if we came out and sang in the daytime. So that is the reason we sleep days and sing nights, so the birds and chickens and bug-eating animals cannot catch us. Of course, sometimes they do get a cricket, but it is always one who has stayed out too late or gotten up too early, usually a very young cricket, who thinks he knows more than his mother or father. But the good little crickets, who mind and get up when they are called, are pretty sure to live to a good old age. When Madam Cricket stopped talking, all the little crickets stood looking at her with very curious expressions on their faces. We are good little crickets, aren't we, mother? they asked. Of course you are. Here you are all ready to go out and sing and the sun has just dropped behind the hill, she said. Chirp, 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 they sang as they scampered after their mother out into the night. The Eat You Up Dicky Duck was a very wise young fellow. He swam about the pond alone long before his brothers left their mother. And such worms and bugs and things of that sort as he found made all the other young ducks quite green with envy. 
But one day, Dicky Duck almost lost his life by thinking he was so wise. For he was swimming around the pond when he came to the woods where Mr. Fox was hiding back of some bushes. Dicky did not go near enough for Mr. Fox to catch him, but Mr. Fox could see that he was a nice plump duck, and it made his eyes shine with longing to look at him. Ah, me, he sighed as Dicky swam by. If only I knew some wise creature to ask. I am far too dull to know anything myself. When Dicky heard the word wise, he felt sure that meant him. For was not he the wisest duck of his size and age? So he stopped swimming and looked around. Mr. Fox had hidden himself well under the bushes now. Not even the tip of his nose could be seen, and he made his voice sound very weak, as if he were a very small animal. Who is it that wants to know a wise creature? asked Dicky Duck. Oh, a poor little animal called Eat You Up, answered Mr. Fox. Laughing so at his joke that he could hardly speak. I am very stupid and do not know much, and I have no wise friends. Dicky Duck had never heard of an eat you up, but he had no intention of letting anyone think that there was anything he did not know. So he swam nearer and said, Well, I am wise, and if you wish to know anything, ask me. Come out where I can see you, and we can talk to each other better. He was trying all the time to get a glimpse of the new animal, but Mr. Fox was a wise creature himself, and he had no intention of being seen. Oh dear, I should hate to show my miserable little self to such a big, fine-looking creature as you are, he said. It is bad enough to have you know I am stupid, but if you will come closer... I will tell you what it is I want to know. Dicky Duck by this time was very brave, for what had he to fear from so small a creature as the eat you up? So he swam right up to the side of the pond, and out bounced Mr. Fox and almost caught him. If Dicky had not used his wings as well as his feet, he would not have escaped but he was in the middle of the pond, swimming for dear life. By the time Mr. Fox was in the water, and as the farm was not far off, Mr. Fox decided not to risk his life. When Dicky Duck reached the barnyard, he told all the fowl about the strange animal he had seen, called an eat you up, and that while he had a very weak voice, he was almost as large as Big Rover the dog. Of course, everyone thought Dicky wiser than ever when he told this, but for all that he was very careful not to swim near the woods again, for, though he had told the fowl he had seen an eat you up, he was pretty sure in his own mind that he had met Mr. Fox. Morning Glory Once upon a time, there was a very little morning glory that grew on the end of a high vine. And one day, when the wind was blowing, a brisk breeze passed by the little morning glory, making it wish it too could go along and see more of the world. The big mother vine knew what was in the heart of a little glory. So she whispered soft words of love to it, and told the little flower that it must never follow the breeze, for he was a wanderer and might take it far from its home, where it would be very unhappy and perhaps die out in the cold world. But the silly little morning glory still wanted to leave the big vine, and the next time the breeze came along, it pushed up its head, and the breeze took it off the big vine 
and bore it along with it, far, far away. But by and by, the wind grew tired of carrying the little glory, so it dropped it, and when the morning glory looked around it, found it was in the midst of big tall trees and rocks and briars. Vainly it tried to crawl along to a tree where it could twine itself around and climb, but it was too small, and then the rain came, and made it cold and wet, and even the fickle wind did not come to it again. Then the cold days came, and the poor little glory grew faded, and had to crawl under the dead leaves for protection. When the summer came again, up came the little glory, but it was a sad little flower. Now it longed to climb, but it was too small to do anything but lie on the ground. After a while it grew near to a bush and put its weak little vine around it, hoping to get off the ground. What do you mean by trying to cling to me? said the bush. I have all I can do to take care of myself. So the poor little morning glory dropped back to the ground. By and by it grew long enough to reach a tree, and slowly it climbed up the big trunk, until it came to the branches. Now I shall be able to see the world, it thought. This tree is big and will shelter me, and I can climb to the very top. As soon as the big tree saw what was happening, it told the little morning glory it would not have it climb about its branches, because it would spoil its leaves. What are you doing in our woods? asked the tree. You should be growing in a garden, on an arbor, or up the side of some little house. How came you here? The poor little glory had to tell how it ran away from its mother with the breeze, and was left alone in the woods all winter. Please don't send me back to the ground, I cannot see a thing there, and I am so lonely, pleaded the little morning glory. I am sorry for you, said the tree, but I cannot have my leaves spoiled on any account. I'll tell you what I will do but you must be satisfied and never ask for more liberty. If you do, back you go to the ground. The little morning glory was so lonely and sad, it was ready to promise anything to get off the ground. You should stay where you are, but you cannot grow up any higher. If you do, I shall grow my twigs and leaves about you and crush you, said the tree. So the little morning glory had to promise to stay on the trunk of the tree and never grow any higher. But it sighed for its mother vine, and because it could not climb, never grew any bigger blossoms, but tiny little flowers which sighed, because they could not stretch out their vines and grow. But the tree kept the little glory to its promise, and not a vine could get above the trunk. Then one day, when the days grew cold and the morning glory vine was going to sleep for the winter, the runaway glory was heard to say to the other blossoms, Children, be careful of the breeze and what he may tell you next summer. I may not be here to care for you, but he will surely come and tempt you to go along with him. He is fickle, and will carry you far, far away, and then drop you in a place perhaps worse than this. For we do not belong here, but in a garden with other flowers. I ran away from my mother vine one day, and this is where the breeze left me. So cling to the big tree as long as you bloom, for here you are safe at least even if you do not live and bloom in a garden. And then she went to sleep. The Peacock Butterflies Plain little Miss Butterfly sat on a bush one day. 
when along came Mr. Peacock, with his tail full spread. Oh, oh, sighed little Miss Butterfly, how handsome he is, if only I could have a dress like the colors of Mr. Peacock's tail, all the other butterflies in the world would envy me. But here am I, only a plain little creature, with no color to boast of, while all my cousins have gorgeously colored gowns. Oh, how I do wish he would give me two feathers from his tail, that I might have them made into a gown. And then this plain little butterfly, because she was so plain and had no beauty to speak about, began to think about handsome Mr. Peacock, I wonder if he is vain, she said out loud. Vain? Of course he is. There is no one in the world so vain as he, said the bee, who was sipping honey nearby. Miss Butterfly did not ask any questions, and Mr. Bee was too busy to say more. But when he flew away, Miss Butterfly began to think, and the more she thought, the stronger became her intention to fly over to the peacock and speak to him. Over she went, alighting on a flower near him. Mr. Peacock, she said, I wonder you never have wished to see yourself. You are so handsome. I have, replied Mr. Peacock. Often I have gazed into the pond and beheld my handsome self. Oh, that is not at all what I mean, said Miss Butterfly. Suppose you were to see the very pattern of your beautiful tail flying all about you. Then you could look at your beauty as it really is. I do not see at all what you mean, said Mr. Peacock, who was not very quick at thinking. I mean, if you would give me two tips from your beautiful tail, I could have a handsomer gown than any other butterfly in the world, said the little flatterer. And besides that, you would no longer hear the yellow and black and those brown and black butterflies say that they were the handsomest creatures in the garden. I should outshine them all. Mr. Peacock stood up and strutted about, and all the time little Miss Butterfly flew close to him and flattered him. Oh, how jealous they would be if I had a dress like your beautiful tail, for there are no colors in the world so gorgeous, and they would call me the peacock butterfly. Think of that. You would have the most beautiful butterfly in the world named for you, Mr. Peacock. Mr. Peacock could not resist this flattery. He told her she could choose the two tips she best liked and have someone to pull them out. It did not take Miss Butterfly a minute to fly to the tree nearby, where Mr. Woodpecker was at work and ask his help, for she knew he did not bother butterflies. His work was to find small insects. Before the end of the summer, the garden folk saw Miss Butterfly, but not plain little butterfly now, for she wore the most gorgeous gown in the garden, of blue and black, and next year all the other butterflies were jealous of the peacock butterfly, who wore the handsomest gowns in the world. Mr. Peacock struts more than ever every time he sees one of the handsome creatures he helped to dress, but no one knows that it was due to the flattery of plain little Miss Butterfly that the family name was created.